Hello, this is Lynn Fraser with the Killaby Center for Recovery. I'm excited today to be here with Adina Bankleys. One of her specialties is covert emotional incest. And she does work with psychodrama, which we haven't covered yet in the summit. And so I'm really interested to know more about that too. She has a lot of experience. She works in training and workshops. And um, I'm over to you, Adina, <laughs> and just say whatever it is that you'd like to say as an introduction. Thanks so much, Lynn. It's really great to be with you. And I'm very, very excited to be able to share some of my information, knowledge, expertise, uh, experience, strength, and hope as a trauma survivor, as well as a professional with your audience. So thanks so much for asking me to do yeah. this. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah. I am a person who got in the field because I could not fix my own family. And I think it's really important for people to hear, you know, why did you become a therapist? So that's part of who I am, why I want to say this. My role in my family was to mediate, was a fixer, a therapist. So I've been doing this a very long time. And because I couldn't really fix anybody, I could just make, make them feel better for a while that I had this black hole that started to grow inside me. And by the time I was 14 or 15, I knew that I wanted to be a psychologist because back where I grew up in New York, they didn't have social work. Like I didn't know from a social worker or a professional counselor, you were either a psychiatrist or a psychologist. Mm -hmm. So I knew I wanted to do that. And I wanted to quote unquote, help people. Really what I wanted to do was fix people fix them in the image that I wanted them to be or that I thought they should be. So still coming from a very young place. Mm -hmm. And what I know now from my experience, uh, and I thank my first mentor when I moved out here to Tucson in 1990, who asked me, why did you get in the field in the first place? And I said, I want to help people. And he said, bull blank. <laughs> That's pretty clear. <laughs> that was very clear. And yeah. um, he said, I really want you to go and research why you became a therapist. So what I'm telling you now is I couldn't fix my own family. I had this black hole. I thought I could fill it by fixing others. Mm -hmm. And what I found was that I couldn't fix others. And I was very frustrated. And so the black hole got bigger until I uh, went to treatment myself. I went to residential treatment for five weeks for something called codependency, which what mm -hmm. I know now is that I grew up in a family with these roles, that I right. looked outside of myself for my self-worth, for my self-esteem, mm -hmm. and that the controlling behavior was so intense that I was suicidal and I had relapsed in my bulimia. And I know that I'm not here to tell my personal story. However, I think it's really important in terms of healing from trauma that people here, professionals, have their story. And if I'm not aware of yeah. that story, if I'm not working on my own personal stuff, then I am going to be projecting it on clients. It's going to interfere in my therapeutic relationship and my therapeutic work. So my integrity, the integrity to have my own therapist, to be doing that work, of course, it's on and off now, to be in consultation supervision is really critical. So that's a, a very important piece I want people to hear. Mm -hmm. So now I'm a witness for others. I'm a guide. I'm a consultant. Mm -hmm. uh, and I go to the depths with people. Uh, if, th if that's where they want to go and that's where they need to go, mm -hmm. I take them as far as I can. And I also believe I can't take anybody further than I've gone. So, or ask them to do what I'm not willing to do. Right. And so, uh, so that's personally and how I come into the profession. Mm -hmm. I've been in the profession for just about 30 years now. I have a master's in clinical social work. I'm a licensed substance abuse counselor here in Arizona. I have a board certification in uh, traumatic stress from the Ameri American Academy of Experts in Traumatic Stress. 
and I'm a certified psychodramatist from the American Board of Examiners in Psychodrama that's here in the United States. Mm -hmm. So credential wise, and, and I always throw in, I'm also a certified Imago relationship therapist, but I don't particularly do that specifically focused work with Imago anymore. But that's very much a basis of my couple's work that I do. Right. I'm quite familiar with that too. I think it's a wonderful way to communicate with each other. Yes, it's a wonderful model. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, and it's really been a foundation for me to build on. And I use a lot of psychodrama now in my couple's work, which has been significant in terms of healing trauma. Uh, and we can talk more specifically about how I use that and why I do it. I don't want to go into that right now without questions. So, so that's, I think that's me. Um, the only thing else I would say is that I'm an author of Covert Emotional Incest, The Hidden Sexual Abuse, A Story of Hope and Healing. That was published in February of 18. It's available on Amazon and on my website or through my website, which is adinabanklees.com. Good. We'll put those up here too so people can refer to them. Great. And I know I have a Facebook page and I'm supposed to have something on Instagram, but I still don't understand it. <laughs> so <laughs> my marketing people set all that up and I don't know. So people can find me. <laughs> okay. So the website and Facebook are the two main ways right now. Okay. 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 Good. All right. So ask me what you want. Ask me what's important. So, you know, at the Killaby Center, it's a, a mindfulness-based recovery center and right. it's a trauma-first center. So recognizing what are the drivers of addiction. And you know, it fits in really well with Dr. Gabor Mate too, asking, don't ask, look, don't look at the addiction, look at the pain that underlies the addiction. And so when I'm choosing people to interview, I'm really interested in people who are working with trauma. And then specifically around addiction, and you mentioned um, eating disorder, you, you've, I know that you've got experiences with different things. So, so I guess part of it is, Maybe just to fill us in a little bit on what it is that you do with people and what's your what's your take on what people need. Like obviously you're no longer trying to fix people. So maybe that's right. so that's good. Care. We got that taken care of. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. We're not relief. trying to fix anybody. <laughs> <laughs> Such a relief when we give that job up. Right. right. <laughs> yeah. So what do you do with people then? People come to you privately. Do you mostly do one-on-one -on -one sessions with people? So great question. So I have a small private practice where mm -hmm. I do individual sessions, couples, and mm -hmm. groups. Okay. I also do professional consultations. So I have a couple of professional consultation groups with independently licensed professionals. And then I do contract work at a treatment center here in Tucson, where I'm doing running psychodrama groups. We don't necessarily call them that, but they, I use action and action methods in the groups that I run, basically psychodrama. So I'm working in an addiction treatment center that very much has the philosophy you and I have, which is we need to treat the underlying disorders that are going on there, which is mostly about trauma. Right. And I think it's important also, like what is trauma? You know, the word, we use that word so much now, and mm -hmm. what does that even mean? And so, very simply for me, <clears throat> excuse me, it's, a, it's an event or series of events. So not necessarily a one-time thing, but it can be an overtime thing that happens where I feel helpless, where I can experience that my life is in danger, like literally, or my integrity is in danger. Mm -hmm. so that it overwhelms my nervous system and my circuitry that I am not able to cope. Mm -hmm. So that could be something, uh, I'm a big fan of Bessel van der Kolk. Mm -hmm. And so Bessel van der Kolk talked years, about, years ago about something he wanted in the DSM called developmental trauma disorder. And what he meant by that was that kids grew up in a family where mom was seriously depressed and wasn't able to bond, where there were addictions in the family and kids were neglected. So it wasn't, again, a one-time event, and it wasn't something necessarily we would say, oh my goodness, like this happened to you, a natural disaster, or, you know, it was over time, 
eroding at their ability to attach or never being able to attach appropriately. And so they couldn't do relationships and they didn't have a sense of self. And then they got into addictions because of you know, these contributing factors. Mm -hmm. So that's how a lot of how I see things. I see things through a trauma lens. Mm -hmm. I try to be open to other ways, but that's kind of how I see things. Mm -hmm. And I see people as people, not as diagnoses. Right. So that's really important. Uh, and one of my other favorite mentors is Colin Ross, mm -hmm. who also said, you know, the DSM is, it's political and like, don't really trust it because people just don't have one diagnosis. They have multiple diagnoses because we're human beings. So that was very helpful for me to hear back in the early nineties. Mm -hmm. So I see people as humans. I want to, I want to treat them as that. Uh, and I really do believe that group therapy is the most powerful modality because of how we need to be connected mm -hmm. and how that connection and if you know i'm not an expert on attachment theory so i don't want to pretend that i am but the ability to form relationships with others and form relationships with my own internal family system so i'm also an internal internal family systems therapy junkie and I love Dr. Richard Schwartz and his model. So I incorporate, what you're hearing is I incorporate a lot of different models in the work that I do. Right. And psychodrama, and I put them all in action. Mm -hmm. So I'm getting off track a little bit. So seeing people as humans, not a diagnosis. Really being with someone and being able to be that primary attachment figure, if you could use that term, of a person who sees them, who really gets them, and is willing to go to any lengths to help them heal. Like I will, like I said before, I will go to the depths with you mm -hmm. if that's where you want to go. Right. And I'm with them no matter what. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and group really allows people to be able to learn how practice those skills right. to to attach appropriately to create relationships, and so. If you, want, if you want, I give you an example. Mm -hmm. And this is a little bit of psychodrama. And so I can't talk about psychodrama without talking about my, one of my mentors and trainers and her name is Dr. Kate Hudgens. And mm -hmm. Dr. Hudgens and Francesca Toscani together developed the therapeutic spiral model of psychodrama, which is a specific model of psychodrama designed for people with post-traumatic stress disorder and dissociative disorders. So we're gonna say trauma. Mm -hmm. So it's really about how do we do this safely? How do we create a safe container for people to be able to manage their nervous system, stay in a place where they can think and feel at the same time as they're doing their healing work? Mm -hmm. Because if they can't think and feel at the same time and they're only in their head, they're not going to learn and be able to take it in their life. If they're all in their emotions, they're not going to be able to ground anything and take it into their life. So, right. So we want them to be able to do both. Mm -hmm. So in the trauma world, that's called the optimal zone of the window of tolerance. We can go there if we want. We don't have to. But just to, the, to think and feel at the same time. So Kate has developed what she calls safety structures. <clears throat> excuse me. And again, I don't want to go into all the detail about it, but what I do with people is I utilize her circle of strengths or circle of safety. And I utilize the internal family systems, eight C's of self-leadership. And self-leadership is, for Dr. Schwartz, really spiritual energies that we have from birth. Compassion, connectivity, creativity, curiosity, courage, calm, confidence. I think I got eight, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and so we identify what strengths we're bringing to the group at that moment. 
and we'll pick a scarf. So I have like 55 scarves of all different shapes, colors, textures, whatever. And people will pick a scarf of what, or a combination of scarves that represent that strength to them. And they'll share, you know, I, I chose this strength or I'll have them in the role. Here's your psychodrama part. And they'll say, you know, I am Adina's creativity. And I'm coming to the group this morning to aid you in getting out of the box and really tapping into having some fun and doing things outside your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. And then we'll put the scarf outside. We'll be in a circle of chairs and we'll put the scarves outside of that circle. And we will do all of the rest of our work in group inside the circle of strengths. So we have that container. Mm -hmm. And I'll say that, I'll say we're within this container. You dump and you leave stuff you want here and you take what you want, you take what you like. Mm -hmm. And sometimes throughout the work, if it gets a little bit intense and I want people to really ground into that thinking and feeling place, you might call it being mindful. Again, mm -hmm. I'm not an expert in what you do. Mm -hmm. So I'll have them stand on those scarves and come back to that strength and say, okay, let's breathe that in. Let's really stand in that energy right now because things are getting a little hot, a little overwhelming. And so they do, we get grounded again and we go back and we do some more work. So I work within that circle of strengths. Um, and what I hear from people are things like, that really allowed me to breathe, to calm down, mm -hmm. to be able to trust a little more. Um, and so just doing that is soothing for people. Very simple, right? It's very simple and it's soothing. The other piece that's really important is confidentiality. And so whether it's individual couples or group, there's always that piece about what goes on in here stays in here, except, and we have professional exceptions. You're thinking of harming yourself or killing yourself. Somebody young is, is being abused or we think, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And we do it in action. Uh, and if I was with you, I would show you, but it's a way that we can lock hands together. It's called the well of confidentiality. Mm -hmm. So again, I'm taking just saying words and putting it in action and connecting people. And they love it. They, it's fun, it's creative. Mm -hmm. And we get to see all of our hands together and how different they are and yet how connected we are. And we'll put our name in the well. We create a, as our hands are together, there's an open space like that. Mm -hmm. And we'll put our name in the well and we'll say the strength we have or a word that represents confidentiality to us. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, I go for levels of safety. And my first level, I'll back up, my first level of safety is always asking, do you need to know anything about me, your facilitator, before we start? Because you don't know me when you first meet me. And what's important for you to know about me for you to feel a little more comfortable? Mm -hmm. And I tell them, I always have boundaries. I get to answer what I choose to answer and I may not answer. Mm -hmm. So I'm already modeling, right? That th right. we can have boundaries. So they feel more comfortable because I'm not an empty slate. I'm not putting myself above you. We're doing this together. I'm totally cool with, with answering questions. We do our confidentiality. They understand it completely. And then we do our circle of strengths. And there's already breathing slower and deeper. And so that's a psychodramatic way with a trauma informed and responsive approach to be able to have people more in their body, be able to observe themselves better. So if they're in that observer self, they can stay in the thinking and feeling, which allows them to then go to take a risk to maybe share something about themselves. And so I'm talking a lot about group because it's most of what I'm doing right now. Mm -hmm. And I'll talk a little about couples as well. Um, so for example, in group, can I, or do you want to ask me a question? Yeah. I, well, I just had a comment. Um, yeah. So you, you're, you're, you're working with people who had experiences as children of not being seen, not being attuned with, not being connected with primarily. And yes. And many of them also have had, that, sexual abuse, physical abuse, neglect, right. um, 
So those those kinds of things as well, domestic violence. Mm -hmm. Right. So if people um, are familiar with ACEs, the adverse childhood experiences, there's a lot of those that are- in Very people. high on the scale, yes. Right. right. And so you're bringing them into a situation where they work with you privately um, or they work and or they work with you in groups. Do you work with people in just in groups or do you always do privates as well? I have a combination. Okay. So I do about 10 individual sessions a week. I do about three couple sessions. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I do groups at this treatment center that I work at. Right. So you're, you're bringing people into an experience of it's safe to be who I am. It's safe to stay in my body. It's safe to share. There's boundaries. There's safety here. Yes. Right. And so I, I think it's fascinating how the whole somatic, you know, the word trauma is a trendy word right now, but so is somatic healing. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that was happening before was it was mostly talk therapy and people weren't really in their bodies. They were thinking more than feeling. Yes. So this trend that you see, I mean, is that what you're seeing as well? That all of a sudden people are going, hey, maybe we have to actually be in our body. Maybe we have to heal the nervous system in order to heal trauma. Uh, absolutely. I, and I think it started again, early 90s. They call it the decade of the brain because that's when the, the brain research just exploded. Right. And so before that, in the, I'm trying to think, and I'm thinking about the United States or Western world, because if you talk about the East, they knew about yes. this and they've been doing this for thousands of years. We're just kind of waking up to it. And then we have a science that's saying that it makes sense. Right. Mm -hmm. But uh, reading Grace Unfolding about Comey therapy back late 80s, early 90s uh, mm -hmm. was about the body right. and about how we have to integrate the body in our in our healing. So I've always been very interested in that psychodrama has done that forever. Uh, I mean, the first psychodrama was 1921. So we're coming up just on about a hundred years. Mm. And Moraine, Dr. Moreno, who developed psychodrama very much believed in the integration of mind, body, and spirit. Mm -hmm. And that's why he said action is the way to do it because you are integrating all levels of your brain that way right. so that you can then lock in that learning and take it with you. Mm -hmm. Yes. So yes. I, and, and yes, it's a trend now. Right. Yeah. Well, and it's a good thing. I think that people are starting to go, oh, okay, maybe it needs to be more embodied, but yeah, it's, it's definitely a trend right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I agree with you. I think it's really important. And the piece that's most important to me is that we're looking at that. How do we get people in that thinking and feeling place and helping them to stay there? Right. And that's really scary to go into feeling and, and to be in our bodies when we've been traumatized. So how do you work with that? In addition to what you've already said, but is there, are there things that you would want to kind of talk to talk about with people? Like if someone's going, okay, that's me. I don't want to be there. Lots of times I'll work with someone. They go, I don't know anything below here. It's all in my head. Right. So, so what, how do you approach that? Well, the first thing I do is let them know that they totally make sense. Right. So my whole piece is how can I help people be safe? Because if I don't feel safe and we go with safe enough, I heard that somewhere and I really like that. If I don't feel safe enough, then I'm not going to take the risk to take the next step. So I want to create a, a, a place where they feel safe enough. So it's joining with them uh, because they do make mm -hmm. sense. Why would you want to go below here if it's been so scary? Exactly. So you don't have to. Yeah. You have a choice every step of the way. So choice is key. You have a choice every step of the way. You want to take, you want to play with me a little bit? We'll take it just a little step and then we'll come back. You want to try something or is today not the day to do it? Right. So really being with them, not forcing, not feeling like they're being manipulated or cajoled or anything and continually saying when it's, when you're done, I want you to say, stop, put your hand up. So allowing them to have control of the work. What I see, Lynn, is that people are willing to go further because right. I, they're not being re-traumatized. Mm -hmm. They are being empowered. And when they stop and they say, you know what? Uh, no, I said, 
thank you for trusting me enough to say no and mm -hmm. to set your boundary. Right. And their eyes, what? I thought, you know, you're the therapist. You're going to want me to do it. No, mm -hmm. I want you to take care of yourself. And right. if that's what this looks like in this moment, I'm thrilled for you. This is awesome. And so what has happened is people come back and they're willing, again, they're willing to take the next step because they're not being forced or manipulated or cajoled to do it. And they don't have to please the therapist. That's the other thing is mm -hmm. I really want to develop that relationship where uh, this is not about pleasing me. And I want to show them that, not just tell them that. Right. You know, one kind of interesting thing comes from, I've, I've taught yoga for a, a long time. And one of the things you know, the first principle of yoga is ahimsa, which is non-harming. And so you can say something like that in a yoga class, you know, like take care of yourself, you know, don't push into pain, all of those kinds of things. But if you're not in your body, you don't know how to be kind. And so what you're doing this work with people, it's like you're, you're saying this is really important to, to know what you need right now and then to be able to express it. So those are two really important experiences that people have and we need to experience safety in our body in our nervous system i love what you're saying and thank you for just kind of bringing it down making it very simple yes and what i want is people to have an experience of that and right. so that's what i am supporting because mm -hmm. that i see is the most healing piece of trauma which is in real time I don't have to necessarily go back to the story of 30 years ago. In mm -hmm. real time right now, with what we're talking about and then practicing being in their body a little bit, know, identifying what they need, being able to express it, being able to say no, being able to say, I don't know. You know, say I'm nervous. I, you know, I'm leaving my body right now. Like if they even are aware of that or being willing to, to have me say, I think your eyes are getting a little glassy. Can, can you come back? Oh, oh okay. Right. For them to have that experience is healing in itself. We're creating those, those new neurons, right? We're creating new neuron connections. And the last thing I'll say is real time connecting with others. Right. So for example, I would have, I had a client last week who said, you know, I, I just feel like I'm taking up too much time in group. I said, well, that's the story you're telling yourself right now. Mm -hmm. is, is that accurate? And I'm always checking because I don't want to be telling people. So that's again for safety, right? Mm -hmm. So is that accurate? Yes. All right. So would you be willing to check out with your group members if your story is accurate? Mm -hmm. And I'd let, if you're willing, and it's always, are you willing, not you have to. Yeah. If you're willing, would you make eye contact with each group member and ask them and wait for their response? And the group members, what I say is, so here's your codependency challenge. Because you could people please, you could say, this is about speaking the truth and taking the risk to speak the truth. And I'll ask the client, the other client, is it okay? Are you, are you up for taking the risk that they might say, yeah, I think you're taking up too much time in group. I'm like, yes, I want them to be honest with me. Okay. Cause we yeah. have that commitment. So in real time, they're making eye contact, mm -hmm. which changes our brain, you know, mm -hmm. that's connection. And they're experiencing an authentic connection with somebody else mm -hmm. in a safe environment. Mm -hmm. right. so it's it's very powerful mm -hmm. so yes i want people to experience we practice for them to be in their body and even if it's for moments right it's more than it was before exactly yeah mm -hmm. and i found most people are are not everybody but most people i find are really eager once they start to experience being able to be in their own body and being able to be safe with other people if they're authentic and they take a risk and it's, and they're met. Yes. Most people, it's such a high when that happens for us. Yeah. And that's the high that can replace the drugs, the alcohol, the sex, the gambling, the food, the, 
compulsive shopping, that whatever, you know, this is what we're wanting. And I'll say that to them, you know, this, how does this feel? This feels so wonderful and scary yeah. because it's new and yeah. it's, I'm vulnerable. I feel exposed. I mean, right. And so we want to transform that vulnerability into strength rather than vulnerability equals victim, because that's, what's been true for them. Right. And so we just, I just keep reinforcing that and mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, it is very powerful, and then they can take it to the next level. Mm -hmm. Well, and so many people live this kind of half life where, you know, we might have people around us, but we're not really being who we are. So it feels like they don't really see us. And to take the risk to be real and to really say what's going on with us or, or show up fully, that's what makes us feel alive. It's no wonder we were looking for a high outside of ourselves because we feel like we're half dead yeah yes or so over activated right and so anxious yeah. that i you know that I, I have to do something to soothe myself soothe, because i yeah. can't i can't even stand to be in my skin right the anxiety is so high yes so mm -hmm. you're talking about right those extremes you're talking about the hypo arousal i feel half dead or i'm so detached from who i am Right. You know, or that anxiety that's so high yeah right right and if i may just to talk about couples mm -hmm. um, one of the things that i have found very powerful in working with couples is to do something that psychodrama calls doubling mm -hmm. and that is about kind of being in the role of being the heart of someone or the inner i mm -hmm. uh so I will, I will sit by, I'll ask my client, can I sit next to you? And I'm going to say something that I sensed you wanting to say that's in there, that's not coming out. And if it's accurate, would you please say it out loud? Or if it's not, you tell me no, or mm -hmm. you put it in your own words. Mm -hmm. I do a lot of this and I do it in group as well, but couples in particular. And so that's what I've taken some out of the imago dialogue where the person would say, you know, I hear you, whatever. And I go for the doubling because the client, I'll just give you an example. So this one couple, the female part of the couple, very serious trauma from prior childhood stuff and within the marriage because of addictions in the marriage. And by me just doubling her saying, there is no way in hell that I'm going to trust you right now. And I have to have my guard up. Mm -hmm. And she looked at me, she went, yes. <laughs> like, yes, that's it. <laughs> yes. You know, and, 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 and that I validated and I said, well, of course, because as evidenced by da, 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 da. And she said, so it's okay. She looked at me, she said, so it's okay that I have my guard up. I said, you bet it is. Now tears just started. Yeah. She was seen, she was validated. I didn't tell her she was crazy. I didn't tell her, you know what, you're in couples, you have to now like totally trust him and open up and tell him, every no. Mm -hmm. And so through both back and forth, for them to be able to hear each other, the doubling is very, very powerful. It helps the person feel like I see them. So that therapeutic relationship, and then they can trust more for their partner and there's more empathy and compassion that comes through. When, when they get the hang of some of that, then I have them double each other. And that really uh -huh. is, that's difficult. Cause I'll say, okay, now you're in the role of your partner's heart. Mm -hmm. And it's really empathy training. It's getting out of my own story. It's getting out of my story. I really have to be with you and get where you're coming from. Uh, I've seen that be more powerful than any other kind of technique that I've learned. And it's tough for people. It's hard. I bet. Yeah. Yeah. But it's very moving. And very clear. Like you would actually know what the other person's feeling and thinking. And you get to check it out. That's the thing is if we're so far apart and I, you know, and I'll be in your, I'll be in the role of your heart and I'm saying something that's way off. My partner says, no, like, wow. Right. Okay. So I don't get, you know, I don't get you help me understand, stay curious. So there's your, one of your eight C's 
of right. self-leadership. We stay curious about stuff so we don't have to be scared of it. Right. So I always say curiosity is my antidote for fear. Because I just, oh, it's interesting. Huh, you're different than me. Huh, right. You're even different. You're different than I thought you were. Huh, interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Rather than, are you kidding me? No, yeah. you should think like me. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So they let, you know, we laugh about it because that's the other piece is we have to have a sense of humor. If I don't, if yeah. I don't laugh, if I can't do that, oh my goodness, I'm not going to get anywhere. And that we're talking about nervous system. I need to balance my nervous system. So if I'm just for, you know, if it's an hour session and I'm just deep, dark, heavy trauma, I, right. I, I, that's not going to work either. I have to have some lightness in there so that my nervous system can regulate. Right. So I use humor a lot too. Mm -hmm. And I do that, and I think because I can form a really good therapeutic relationship with someone, mm -hmm. that I can, we can laugh. So they don't feel like I'm laughing at them. Right. And there are some times when I'll be, I'm a very direct, uh, I don't, I don't beat around the bush. I don't, I don't have time for that. And I tell people, you don't either. Mm -hmm. you, you know, you're wasting your time and money if we're going to do that. So I am direct. I don't want to be shaming. I want to be loving. Mm -hmm. And I want to tell you what, what the story is. And so they appreciate that. Right. Um, to be able to do that with humor. So I'm thinking of one client who I'll just tell like it is. And we laugh. She says, well, of course that, but I would have never thought that. Uh, right. So we can laugh about it. And it's a way for her to take it in mm -hmm. and integrate it. Uh, that works for her. Right, right. Yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So do you think everybody can heal? I think there are certain people that probably would have a greater struggle than others. Mm -hmm. And I think people who don't have a conscience, as far as I know, we don't have a way to put a conscience into people. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if they can develop one. And if that's healing, then that for me, that would be a part of healing for people. Okay. And along those lines, I have seen people come into 12-step program. I've seen it happen on a per, per, personal level. I'm in 12-step program myself. I've seen it on a personal level as well as professionally where I didn't believe they had a conscience. Mm -hmm. And they behaved as if they didn't, and they spoke as if they didn't. Mm -hmm. And as they chose to stay and work the steps, there was this miraculous transformation mm -hmm. to someone who was of great service to the community and others. Mm -hmm. And they had a conscience. So I don't know if it was just really well hidden. Right, right. Yeah. Um, and layers were taken off of it or if there was something spiritually transformative that happened because of the process mm -hmm. where, okay, well, maybe there is a way for us to put a conscience in someone and maybe it's something we don't scientifically have right now. I don't know. It's mm. a mystery to me. Right. But other than that, yes, I believe that people can heal and I think healing just looks different. Right, for different people. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I, th what I, what I talk about is that, so let's say somebody has post-traumatic stress and they're having flashbacks and they're having them often. What I'll say is that I don't know if you're never going to have flashbacks again. I don't think I can promise you that. Mm -hmm. But what I can say is that you can have more time in between the flashbacks right. where you have some peace and serenity, you can enjoy your life. And that when they happen, you'll have more tools to deal with them. Right. You might even be able to anticipate triggers, right? Mm -hmm. But to deal with them and kind of move through it quicker. And then you can have more time again in between. So the time gets bigger. Right. The time you're suffering or triggered gets shorter. Mm -hmm. And it may be intense, but it, you get out of it faster. Right. And then that feels to realistic experience. to me. Yes. And then you have the experience that it's not going to last forever. Yes, yeah. exactly. 
so that you can then have build on that faith and you can say, hey, last time it didn't, so probably not this time as well. Right, right. Mm. It's fun talking to someone with the kind of experience that you have. Um, and just to, I mean, there's so much hope there. You know, it's really clear that you're working really deeply with people and that people are really changing and healing through this work and that everybody can do this. It, it's, not a, it's not an easy thing necessarily. We need courage and we need the right kind of safety in the environment, but it's really possible. It's totally possible. And you're mm -hmm. absolutely right. So there are some requirements and the right. requirements, are, you know, are that there has to be a safe enough place. Mm -hmm. And one of the things for people to know is that if you are living currently in an atmosphere, an environment where there is abuse happening, where there's active addiction going on, mm -hmm. your healing journey is either going to be stunted Mm -hmm. you're not going to be able to get, you know, move as fast as you want to, or you may not be able to move at all, because if it's continuing to happen and be re you're continually being re-traumatized, your right. nervous system can't heal. Right. Does this make sense? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So it's important for people to know that because they'll come in and say, well, why isn't, you know, why aren't this happening faster? Say, well, because you're going home to an active alcoholic wife or husband. Mm -hmm. And so we really, you know, we've talked about that, that your environment has a lot to do with it. So you have safety here for an hour, but you, an hour a week, but you're there for how many hours a week, right? Yeah. 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 Or a, a toxic boss. Or you being yes. At work or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So not just in the home, but other places. So to really talk to people about what their life is like, who are they interacting with? What are they putting in their bodies? So even about, you know, what kind of food are they putting in their bodies? Mm -hmm. uh, and when people, media, are they, um, oh, please. Yeah, yeah. That's so much right now. now. Yeah. Uh, I have a lot of my clients on uh, restriction of social media and news programs. Yeah, I always suggest that too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's too damaging for our nervous system. We can't take that all in and still be working on healing our nervous system. Yeah. Right. There has to be a balance of somewhere. Mm -hmm. Somewhere. Yes. So people don't want to be totally offline. And I get that. And they want to know what's going on in the world. Uh, but we really talk about what's, what's the minimum that you need to know to, to be able to feel like you know what's going on. You're, you're mm -hmm. doing your civic duty, et cetera, et cetera. But it's not, yeah, it's not overwhelming your nervous system because then you can't handle it. It's too much. Mm -hmm. I'm doing that for myself right now. Yeah, I do too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I started when I was working with people with AIDS in the late 80s. I just found that I couldn't take in I couldn't be present at work with all of that grief right. and, and all of that and take it all in from the news too. And I stopped watching the news and, you know, I still know basically what's going on. Somebody will always tell you where there'll be a headline. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's ways to, to keep abreast of it. Yeah. yeah. So let's talk about emotional, uh, covert emotional incest. Uh, that's a specialty of yours. And, what would you kind of what what are the basics of that? People might not quite know what that means. Uh, they probably don't, and I wouldn't expect them to. So mm -hmm. that's why I wrote the book, and that's why I talk about it. And mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, covert emotional incest is an elusive form of emotional sexual abuse, where no physical genital touching has to happen. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there are different components. Number one is, and the main component is, that a child is made a substitute or surrogate spouse for one or both of their care, adult caregivers. Mm -hmm. So in that role of spouse, uh, the spousal role is a sexual role, whether there is physical sex happening or not. So 
otherwise it would be a friend, mm -hmm. you know? So there's sexual energy that is getting transmitted from the adult to the child. Children are emotional energy sponges. They don't necessarily know in their left cognitive brain, oh, this is sexual energy now that's coming through, right? Yeah. <clears throat> but they pick it up and, <clears throat> excuse me, so it impacts them. They know it and they're going to behave in a certain way. And we talk about it sexualizing that child which means that they can then start to sexualize intimacy, where if it's emotional intimacy, they feel close to someone, they can literally physically start getting aroused. They can then start trying to be physically sexual. Mm -hmm. That's what sexualized means, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so we go back to the spousal role. So there's sexual energy that's getting passed down, which is why we use the term incest. Mm -hmm. or emotional sexual abuse. No physical contact necessarily, but picking up on that energy is a violation of boundaries. Mm -hmm. The spousal role is a violation of boundaries. The child's supposed to be in the child role and the adult's supposed to be in the parent role, taking care of that child's needs. But instead, the roles are reversed and the child is taking care of the parent's needs. Right. So in family therapy, sometimes they called this the parentified child, and they would talk about in an addictive family system how, let's just say the daughter, the daughter, the, <clears throat> the daughter becomes the wife and the mother of the house and starts taking care of the kids. Mm -hmm. So parentified child is one thing, but being the wife, being the parent of other children is one thing. Being the wife is a whole different thing. Mm -hmm. And so there's that part to the point where I could be sleeping in the bed with my parent mm -hmm. and it could be happening at 13 and 15. I mean, and these are examples. This is real. This happens mm -hmm. 17, whatever. Mm -hmm. And there may not be any physical sex happening, right? But what, what's the energy there? What are the messages there? Right. There's also a piece called triangulation that happens. And this is the setup for CEI, I'll just call it CEI now. Uh, and it's a setup for parentification of a child. It's set up for a lot of things, but it's called triangulation. And what it means is that mom and dad will just do stereotype. Mom and dad don't have the skills they need to deal directly with each other in their relationship. So here they're supposed to be that unified committee here connecting. Well, they can't. And so they put the child in the middle. And they use their child now to communicate with each other. Right. That's when the child is in the mediator role. And I just, just heard this from a client the other day. Well, I was the one at seven who would come out and try to mediate the fights that they were having and say, oh, well, didn't you hear mom? She said this. And didn't you hear dad? She so that's just a very classic, powerful example of triangulation. Mm -hmm. So the kid is already not in a kid role, they're in a peer role. Right. And then they can be used as a confidant. You make me feel so much better. I'm so glad I could talk to you. You're the only one I can talk to. Your mother doesn't understand me. You understand me, those kinds of things. And it's very seductive mm -hmm. for a kid who wants to please their parents. We all want to please. Kids want to please their parents, right? Mm -hmm. And it's very much an illusion of power. It's like, oh, I can make them feel better. I'm so powerful. Yeah. But then there's the powerless, which is I can't really fix them. Right. And then the last part is objectifying. And so we can talk about sexually objectifying and we can talk about just objectifying. So the definition of objectify is to make like, make somebody just an object. They're not even human anymore. They're just a thing. Yeah. And unfortunately, what happens with this is that the child is a thing to use to meet these needs. Right. right. It's not meaning that it's malicious. It's not meaning that parents don't want to take care of their kids. We're talking about people who don't have the skills, uh, people who come from wherever they came from, 
who come from wherever they came from. Right. And it's hurtful and it's abusive and it's not okay. Mm -hmm. And then we have sexually objectifying. So the body is so much paid attention to that it's not a self safe place to be in because I've heard that a lot. Mm -hmm. Comments about developing bodies from parents, whether it be same sex or not same sex, it really doesn't matter. Or mm -hmm. even, uh, you know, wow, those you're getting really big breasts now, but you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. And it's like, oh, I don't want you to, don't say that kind of stuff to me. Mm -hmm. uh, other examples are parents walking around nude or in their underwear when kids are not comfortable with that into adolescence. Right. Uh, and the kids' boundaries aren't respected. Mm -hmm. It's very, yeah. So it's, it can be murky. That's why we call it covert because it can be subtle. It could be really kind of obvious, but it's not physical touch where it's like, yeah, they touched me here, you know? Right. And so people say that nothing happened to me. Maybe I was too close to somebody, but I had that icky feeling around them. Like I didn't want them touching me or they hugged me too tight. And I right. got that. So this is happening. It's happening a lot. I'm getting, when I'm getting emails, phone calls uh, from people literally all over the world now who mm -hmm. have seen my YouTube videos, read my book and said, oh my goodness, this is my story. I've been in therapy 20 years. Nobody ever asked me about this. We never talked about this. Right. This is why, oh my goodness. So it's so important to me that people have a context. People get some kind of definition of this to see if it fits for them or not. And I want to be very clear. I am not saying that if you're close to your kids that you're abusing them. Right. Yeah, there's a big difference. People need to be connected with their kids and attuned to their kids. Yeah. Yes. And yeah. attuned to their kids. If I am meeting their needs, I'm good. If I'm starting to meet mine, that's when we're crossing the boundaries. And if, and if I don't know that, because I'm unconscious about it, right. Um, right. I, need, I, I need to get help, you know, if something's happening. So for ex another example is there are a lot of moms now who are wanting to be their daughter's BFF, oh, going yeah. to parties and dressing like them and you know, hanging out with them in that way. And right. it's just not appropriate. Right. So to be my daughter's best friend means I have her back no matter what. She can come to me with anything and I have her back. And I will allow her to have natural and logical consequences to her choices. Right. That's being her best friend. Right, yeah, yeah. So what does that look like in adult relationships? when someone has had that as their childhood experience? Oftentimes it shows up as, I don't know what my needs are. I only know what yours are. I will be in the caregiver, caretaker role with you. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I will probably end up resenting you. Right. So uh, I don't ask for anything. You don't really know about me. I'm all focused on you. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> difficulty with intimacy so emotional because if I can't be authentic with you we don't have into me see I only see into you I don't let you see into me mm -hmm. so I don't have that uh, sexual right. difficulties show up in all shapes and forms mm -hmm. mom or dad you know parent being in the middle of the adult relationship mm -hmm. so wives telling me my husband's having an affair with his mother. She's right. always here. She, he's always on the phone with her. He runs whenever she calls and needs something. Right. Like, so, and I've had it the other way. And husband's saying to about, you know, the father is in the middle here. You know, I can't get close to my wife. Right. Uh, so not being able to be authentic, being in the caretaker, not being able to identify wants and needs. Addictions mm -hmm. show up in all forms here. Eating mm -hmm. disorders often with CEI. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, for myself, you know, anorexia and bulimia as a teenager, perfectionist, caretaker, controller, mm -hmm. a high achiever, 
Right. And so, yeah, it's, it's debilitating mm -hmm. and really having the imposter syndrome, thinking if you really knew me, you really, you wouldn't want to be connected with me. I have to be doing for you in order to be lovable. Right. That's the message that gets locked in really. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's probably a lot more common of an experience than people might think, especially with so many single parents now. And I really, my heart goes out to single parents because it's such a setup for this because who's there to support them? Right. You know, and I talk about how, how critical it is for them to develop that peer support system. Right. Uh, you know, for that reason. And it's important for people who are listening, if you're saying, my goodness, you know, I think she's onto something, I think that may have happened to me, mm -hmm. that yes, there's healing from that. Right. Very much healing from that. Yeah. And on my YouTube uh, channel, I do a little bit of a video of the five elements of healing. Mm -hmm. And so just to say very quickly, so just to start being aware and naming it. Right. Asking for help. If anything that people get from our talk today, what I want them to get is that asking for help is a strength, not a right. weakness. Mm -hmm. Because that is the key element to healing trauma and addiction, is asking for help, allowing, receiving, which allows me to then be connected. And the connection with people, as we were talking about, that's the high, that's the, the oxytocin and the dopamine and the chemicals that are going on. That's what we're looking for. Right. So asking for help, learning about boundaries. What are they? How do I set them? How do I enforce them? Mm -hmm. um, sensuality and sexuality. Very important. We're talking about being in our bodies. What kinds of things do we like? What do we not like? Can I be sensual without being sexual? Mm -hmm. People don't know this, these kinds of things, and we don't have time to go into them, but just to, to right. be mentioning them. A sense of spirituality. And mm -hmm. for me, spirituality is about a, an awareness that there is something, some force, something out there that's greater than me, some kind of resources mm -hmm. that's greater than me. And that's what I equate with asking for help. I don't have all the answers. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have this thing called forgiveness, which is a complicated issue. Right. Yeah. And basically what I tell people is that forgiveness is a process. It's a process of identifying, of feeling, of mm -hmm. understanding. That's a gift for myself. <coughs> Excuse me. And it's not about forgetting. Mm -hmm. It's not about absolving of sin. It's not about kiss, kiss, make up, nice, nice. It's about, I'm going to do this for me. I got to be aware of what it is. I'm willing to feel about it. Right. I'm willing to, right? I'm willing to get that it's probably generational. Um, and at some point, I'm going to make the decision that I am going to let go of running it over in my head over and over and over. Right. And I'm going to move on with my life, whether yeah. I choose to have a relationship with this person, place or thing or not, right. but I am going to be free. Right. Mm -hmm. That seems like a, a good place to, to finish. I'm going to be free. <laughs> and you have a right. Freedom is your birthright. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So let's go over how they can get a hold of you again. If you want okay. to say your website and your website book. is adinabanklees.com and you'll have it up the spelling yeah. you'll have up there for people. Mm -hmm. um, Adina Bankley's Facebook page. Mm -hmm. And the book is Covert Emotional Incest, The Hidden Sexual Abuse, A Story of Hope and Healing. You can get it on Amazon and it's also you can get it through my website. Okay. Cool. Well, thank you so much. This has been really deep and fascinating and um, I think would give people a sense of what healing looks like as well as the possibilities that are here.
I hope so, Lynn. I hope I, hope yeah. I didn't go into too much detail about certain things that, that people would oh. get lost. So I hope the message comes through. Yeah, yeah. And it's quite simple, even though there's a lot of complexity. You know, it's actually quite simple. Thank mm. you for helping it keep it simple. Yeah. Well, thank you for thank talking you. with me. This has been wonderful. Thank you. Same here. Yeah. Best thanks. to you. All righty. Yes. Bye-bye. Thanks. Hello, this is Lynn Fraser with the Killaby Center Radical Recovery Summit. We are so excited to bring you the lineup for January 10th to 19th, 2020. Go to RadicalRecoverySummit.com to see the new headliners for 2020 and to sign up. You can watch free January 10th to 19th or buy an all-access pass.